So at lunch you told me something that I didn't know, and that was the mechanism through which tracheomites took out the German black bee. Mm -hmm. Would you explain that again, like you explained yeah. at lunch? Yeah, and so this is, this is something that I feel like I've known for a long time, which, and when we talked about this, yeah. it's sometimes difficult to remember where we've read things or heard them. Yeah. But I, I do remember that when I was reading about um, the history of parasites in honeybees and how traditionally we've bred bees to be resistant to certain things, um, and whatnot, that there's a lesson to be learned for about tracheomites with how we're now breeding for varroa resistance. So tracheomites appeared as a major problem in the 19th century, I believe, in Britain. Uh, back then it was known as Isle of Wight disease, which is an island off the South English coast. Um, and back then that was when most of Northwest Europe and indeed the US yeah. by virtue of who brought bees here Well, it didn't get here until it wasn't a problem here until the early 1980s. Oh, when, yeah. the, when it kind of yeah, re-emerged I suppose, yeah. yeah At least back in Northwest Europe though um, The disappearance of the kind of native black bee as they're called which was Apis mellifera subspecies mellifera uh, and you call it the German black bee in Britain, we yeah. call it the British black bee in Ireland. They call yeah. it the Irish black bee to the Danes, it's the Danish, you know. I'll pick a country in Northwest Europe and they're going to call it their own black bee. But really what matters <laughs> is that it was mellifera mellifera. Um, um, we see very, very few examples, arguably not now, of purebred mellifera mellifera stock. There are some efforts in, in parts of Europe to really preserve that lineage. But one of the reasons it disappeared was because it was extremely vulnerable to tracheal mites. And when that mite invaded, uh, bee breeders quickly brought in stock from elsewhere in Europe to breed resistance into their, into their bees across northwest Europe. And so we, we lost the purebred mellifera mellifera because it was so vulnerable to this invasive parasitic mite. Now, my understanding of why that happened um, was that by virtue of being the most, to some degree, northerly, northwest uh, Europe subspecies of honeybee, you know, certainly compared to those around the Mediterranean or, or in Africa or the Middle East, um, mellifera mellifera was capable of flying in much colder temperatures. And they in part achieved this by vibrating their muscles very strongly to warm themselves up akin to how we shiver in cold weather. And this is something we know that a lot of um, northern latitude bees can do. Like bumblebees are famous for this. They can decouple their flight muscles from their wings and just vibrate the flight muscle without flapping the wings in order to warm themselves up so they can achieve the body temperature necessary to then fly. Uh, certain moths and butterflies also do this as well. Now, in order to do that in the quite cold weather of Northwest Europe, mellifera mellifera um, needed to be able to burn energy in its muscles very quickly. And that requires a lot of oxygen. We know that when you use your muscles a lot, you need a lot of oxygen, that's why we get out of breath. And so in order to supply that much oxygen, they needed to have larger and more expansive breathing tubes, which are their trachea. And my understanding has always been that the adaptation for cold weather flight led to them having bigger trachea, more expansive trachea, to satiate their oxygen demand, but that meant that the tracheal mites were much more uh, dangerous in those mellifera mellifera subspecies because they could make use of these big, enlarged, more expansive tracheal tubes. I'm, to I'm totally ignorant on the size and you know dimensions of that uh, tube, but is it, did it mean that the tube was larger and it made it easier for them to enter? Or? I think it was that a it was easier for them to enter and they could also get further in okay. to the to the bee body. Um, eventually the tracheal mites reach a point where so the trachea are too small. I've, I've seen pictures him. under microscopes where those tubes were just packed. Yeah. And of course now I, I tried to get uh, Jamie Ellis over when he was still at the lab there in UGA to teach me how to find trachea mites and we went through the whole routine we couldn't find it no. i mean in a bunch of samples we could not yeah, find they're one. unusual to find to encounter now and partly that's because we don't really keep purebred mellifera mellifera anywhere but also tracheal mites they're a mite much like varroa mites if you're treating for varroa what you're treating your treatment plan is likely to be killing tracheal mites as well it would we would expect anything that can kill varroa to kill tracheal mites and so i think they're now taken care of incidentally 
part via genetics, but also part via modern varroa control methods, which, especially in Jamie Ellis's lab, will be being done properly, I guarantee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a little bit, a kind of a colorful story off that subject a little bit, but when I lived in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. I was called by the state of Oregon. They were suddenly short of bee inspectors because mm -hmm. the trachea mite was just coming on the scene. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had a number of uh, beekeepers that were migrating to North Dakota for the summer mm -hmm. and then migrating back to Southern Oregon mm -hmm. for the winter. But I know there was great concern about these beekeepers coming home yeah. from North Dakota. So when they arrived and their bees were still in holding yards, the inspectors would uh, get there and take samples out of colonies and run them back to the lab mm -hmm. up in uh, Northern Oregon. I think it was in S University of Oregon they were doing some of that work. W and Eugene? Uh, I can't remember where I was mailing the samples. Mm -hmm. We were doing little alcohol bottles and taking samples and mailing them off. Anyway, um, at that time it was zero tolerance. If they found mm -hmm. one trachea mite, they were going to burn your yard <laughs> of bees. And I had a friend there, a large beekeeper, 3,000 colonies, and mm -hmm. he had one holding yard that had a semi-load in it, which was 400 colonies for mm -hmm. him, 400 plus. And they found two trachea mites in that yard. And they literally piled all the bees up in a pile and burned them all mm -hmm. down. And uh, what was so ironic and angered him so much was that six months later, uh, the authorities just threw up their hands and said, we can't stop the trachea mite open borders. Mm -hmm. After they burned him and other beekeepers down, and uh, it's like this stuff. You can't stop it. You're not gonna. It's not gonna stop at the Oregon border. No, as, and especially in the continental U.S., I yeah. think that's uh, something of a fool's errand. I mean. Here in Georgia, we know that um, things tend to arrive here pretty quickly because almost all the new pests and diseases that occur in bees and wider agriculture typically arrive via Florida because it's so it's so warm and it's a major part. Small hive beetles arrived by there. Varroa arrived by yeah. there. Well, um, I, I think I got this information from uh, Keith Dellop. No, P. N. Williams, a beekeeper in Atlanta had a little black beetle in his colony, it's a long time ago, and he said, I don't know what this thing is, and there's a bunch of them, so he sent samples off to Keith Delplane, uh -huh. and Keith Delplane actually had to do some research before he figured oh, out, this is the small, small hive beetle. beetle. So I think the first one found was down around Atlanta with a friend of mine, and uh, of course we know that we know what happened then. Yeah, yes we do, <laughs> and small hive beetles just certainly not keeping out of anywhere. I mean, those little blighters, I think they fly up to 30, oh, yeah. 35 miles to find a new yeah. colony. And the, the adults live up to six months. They're really hardy creatures. And they are. And I found out just through casual observation, when I used to take my bees to South Georgia for the, the winter, mm -hmm. I'd get a pretty good population of hive beetles going on down there. And on the trip home, which was just a five-hour drive mm -hmm. in the night, in the dark, quite often yards that were heavily infested, when I would check them after they arrived here, there was almost no hive beetles. So they were exiting the trucks yeah. in the dark. And so you were just driving up through Georgia yeah. spraying high beetles <laughs> across the landscape. Wow. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in my own defense, I mean, this was after they were all... No, I know. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, we were already deep into them everywhere by that time. Yeah, uh, but my I, point I, being that they, they were flying off the truck in the dark. No. So... No. Yeah. yeah, I might have to cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank oh, you. That's awesome.